Welcome to E360 TV, the live streaming and on-demand destination for influential voices and enlightened audiences. We offer trending, grassroots, and purpose-driven content across a diverse range of interests. E360 TV is more than just watching programs. We offer the ability to interact with live shows connecting audiences to real, authentic influencers and storytellers while streaming to millions of devices. Real experiences. Raw conversation. One destination for it all. E360 TV. Hello there, my amazing, phenomenal leaders. Welcome to yet another episode of Take the Lead, a consciousness movement with Anjali Kapoor. Now, as you well know by now, I am your host, Anjali Kapoor. In addition to being the host of the show, I am also a conscious leadership coach, multi-book author, inspirational speaker, as well as the founder of Oversight Global, where we are on a mission to address the consciousness crisis in the world, one leader at a time. Now, today we have a great guest here with us, and I'm excited at what we'll be exploring in our discussion, as I'm sure a majority of you watching will find it totally relatable. And I'm going to go ahead and set up our discussion in my monologue. Okay, so as you know, the premise of this show, Take the Lead, a Consciousness Movement, is to look at the parallels between salsa and ballroom dancing, or essentially couple dancing, with leadership development. Now, you know, just about adding some fun, taking on leadership to, a, to better enable us to recognize and embody what I call our inner phenomenal leaders. Now, leadership, like salsa and ballroom dancing, requires a certain level of skill, coordination, and rhythm. Now, just as in dancing, a good leader must be able to anticipate the next move, adjust their steps accordingly, and seamlessly guide their partner through the steps. Now, similarly, in leadership in really any context, a good leader must be able to navigate through challenges, adapt to changes, and inspire their team, their group, or their family to achieve their goals. Now, whether it's leading a team of employees or dancing with a partner, the same principles apply, staying in sync, communicating effectively, and trusting one another. However, having a chronic medical condition, the topic of our, of our discussion today can throw you off your groove and your rhythm, making it difficult to keep up with the pace of life. 
Now, the physical and emotional challenges of chronic medical illnesses can leave you feeling exhausted, overwhelmed, and disconnected from the things that bring you joy in life. But just as in dancing, there are many ways to adapt and still happily dance the dance of life with a chronic medical condition. Now, by focusing on strategies like self-care, building a support system, and adjusting your expectations, it's possible to find balance and fulfillment in life even with a chronic medical condition. Now with the right mindset and approach, it's possible to continue leading, dancing, and living life to the fullest. And with that, what are your thoughts or questions on my monologue today? Let me know by emailing me at admin at oversightglobal.com. Okay, phenomenal leaders, as you saw there, don't forget to check out our newly redesigned website if you haven't already at www.oversightglobal.com. And there's this is where you will also find information on our new coaching experience that we are just launching called Meant to Leap. So be sure to check both of those out. You won't be sorry. Okay, so let's get to our guest spotlight. Now, Jeff Pearson is here with us on the show today. Now, Jeff is a speaker, author, business owner, and TV show host, actually a fellow E360 TV show host. Now, when Jeff was two weeks old, it was confirmed that he had hydrocephalus and underwent his first brain and abdominal surgery. Now, since then, over the years, he's had many similar surgeries, each with its own set of challenges and victories. Now, despite the challenges of his condition and lots of surgeries, he's been able to travel the world with up with people. He's gotten married, raised three kids, worked as a private investigator, and is now the owner of Hydro with Hope and the host of his TV show, Invisible Condition, which airs live twice a week on E360. Now, which brings um, awareness to all the medical conditions millions of people deal with that aren't visible from the outside. Now, through Hydra with Hope and his TV show, Jeff spreads the message that first, you are not alone. Second, there is hope. And third, there is a community of help and resources out there for you. So phenomenal leaders, please help me welcome Jeff Pearson to the show. Jeff, thank you so much for being here today. I can't tell you how excited I am for our conversation. Thank you, Angelie. This is awesome. I'm so glad. I'm just, yeah. yeah. Thank you for <laughs> inviting me. This is so cool. Oh, yeah, of course. Now, before I forget, there will be a QR code below in the right bottom corner of your screen where you can check out Jeff's organization, Hydro with Hope. So be sure to scan that and check it out. So like I mentioned in my intro and in my monologue, there are a lot of people out there in the world who have some type of medical condition, myself included. Um, one of the things that I've learned in terms of my own medical conditions is that in order to thrive, 
um, despite them is to really, it really takes you being the leader of yourself and in your own life. So Jeff, I wanted to start off our conversation by um, just kind of sharing with everybody, you know, about you and your medical condition. I mean, I know that there's tons of people out there who has no idea what, you know, water on the brain is. So can you just explain that to us a little bit? Sure. So water on the brain is kind of a slang term for hydrocephalus, which okay. is the condition that I was born with. And that is that it, I know it's a mystery to most people. It's, it's very like, what the heck is that? But it's, it's actually really, really, really common. But the reason that not a lot of people have heard about it is because it is invisible from the outside. So mm -hmm. You'd never watch me walking down the street and go, yeah, I, I can tell what he, he's got hydrocephalus. <laughs> obviously tell he's walking like somebody with hydrocephalus. It's a, uh, it's a very in, invisible internal type of condition. Uh, it does require right. brain surgery from time to time. Uh, and I've had seven total so far uh, in my 47 years on this planet. And uh, hopefully, you know, knock on wood, we don't have to do any more, but We'll see. Uh, so, yeah, that's, I mean, in a nutshell, that's, that's, that's what, what hydrocephalus is. is. I mean, I can talk about more about what the condition actually is medically if you'd like, but that's, you know, that's, that's kind of my, you know, intro to it, I suppose. Sounds good. So you did mention that you have had seven brain surgeries, um, yeah. you know, throughout your life so far. So, um, and that is because I know when we talked earlier, that was because um, there's a shunt that they actually put in your brain that goes to your abdomen to drain that water from your brain that's supposed to naturally happen, but um, people yeah. with hydrocephalus, it doesn't. So um, I know one of the things that I was really curious about when you were kind of explaining to me the mechanism of you know what they have to do um, over these surgeries is, well, how do you, first of all, how long do these shunts last? And then how do you know yourself, like it's kind of, kind of time for another surgery to change out that shunt? Yeah. So how long do they last? If you look at the averages, like by, mm -hmm. you know, by all the medical associations or, you know, whoever decides the averages, uh, the, I don't really know who decided all this, but apparently over the decades that these shunts have been being used over the last 50, 60 years, the average lifespan of these things is about two to three years. Okay. Unfortunately. And so fortunately, I have in 47 years being on this planet for being 47 years old, I have only had to have seven brain surgeries. That oh. is way below the average. Um, it, but it's really an individual thing. It just depends on, you know, who you are. I mean, I've, I've had seven. I know somebody I just talked to that's had 27. She's oh my goodness. Other than me. I know somebody half my age that's had over a hundred. So you just don't know. It's all an individual thing. Yeah. So how about you personally? I mean, how do you kind of know that it's time for you to switch out your shunt? So that can vary. But for me personally, the I'll just take the last 10 years. I've had four brain surgeries in the last 10 years. And uh, the first two were in 2014. And uh, it, it traditionally, it's headaches, headaches, headaches. Uh, it kind of feels like you're wearing a swimming cap that's four sizes too small. <laughs> You know, it's kind of just, you know, and it's yeah. just, it pressure is unbearable. And, uh, you know, some people have nausea with it and different things, but me personally, it's really just, um, just the headaches and, and dizziness and vertigo. And just, you, you get to be a headache connoisseur, uh, oh, I'm as, sure, as yeah. with you, you go, Oh, well, there's a headache. Well, let's see. Is that one that I need to worry about? Or is that just cause I didn't eat enough, drink enough, get enough sleep? Oh, we can remedy that, or we need to go to the hospital. You know, so right, right, we get pretty custom right. to uh, to what headaches mean. What? So. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Now, despite your condition and your several surgeries, you've been able to travel the world, get married, you have three kids, you've worked as a PI, and you know now you have your own company and your own TV show, um, which is amazing. So. What did, did your travel, I mean, where did you travel in the world? And I mean, did your travels kind of enlighten you on like the different ways that different countries kind of deal with your condition? Oh, man. Uh, well, not so much that uh, because 
really up until from, from, I mean, I, I had three surgeries growing up. I had one at two weeks, had one about six months and had one at about 18 mm -hmm. years old. And, and so, I mean, really up until I was about 36 smooth sailing, I didn't nice. really, it was, it was kind of just a non-event. I mean, okay. I mean, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't call brain surgery a non-event, but relatively speaking, you know, we had surgery, we moved on, everything was cool. And so, you know, as, as I, you know, as I got to travel, like, as you said, I got to travel, um, in 1996 after, right after that brain surgery, by the way, really made my parents nervous. Oh, wow. <laughs> <I> <laughs> of said, course you were 18. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I'm 18 and you're going to cut me loose for a year. Let me travel around the world with a group. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah. I can't, they, er, they have, my parents have earned every gray hair they have on their head. I'll tell you that. Uh, <laughs> but yes, that was that was an amazing experience. And it, yes, I, I mean, 18, you're so impressionable, you know, mm -hmm. and you're, you're, you're used to living on, under mom and dad's roof. And now you're on your own for a year with people right. from, I, you know, the group I traveled with was called up with people. It was a great group. It was an amazing experience. I would recommend it to anybody. They're still mm -hmm. around. Look into it. If you like to travel, oh, it's a great oh, deal, nice. a great experience. But yeah, we went, we went all over the U S we went up and down the East coast. And then we spent about four or five months over in Europe between, you know, Switzerland and Belgium and Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, Germany, Belgium. Um, wow. Gosh, where else? I don't know. I went to, got into the Netherlands a little bit, Austria. I don't know. It was, it was unbelievable. Um, mm -hmm. And I was one of the singing, you know, I was one of the folks that did the singing. And so I was, uh, you know, it was, it was a, it was a tiring year. But it was absolutely amazing. And, you know, again, I didn't really think about this, this shunt thing really at all because it was working very well. And it was mm -hmm. very, like I said, kind of like a non-event, you know. Yeah. Um, and so it was, you know, I had an, an amazing childhood, amazing parents that, that did some great, you know, that raised me well and, and did a great job. And so I never really felt sick. You know, I was mm -hmm. never the kid. They never said once to me that I remember no, you can't do that because no one's blank. Right. Because right. you're sick, because you have that thing in your head, because you might get hurt, because it might kill you, whatever. You know, it wasn't like you can't do that. It was more like oh, you're thinking about football. Uh, how about band? You know, or oh, you're thinking about, you know, basketball or something, soccer, where you bang your head against around around a, on a ball all the time. How about we do choir? You know, and so they mm -hmm. They didn't discourage me from stuff. They encouraged me in other directions, you know, and right, they, they, right. they never made me feel less than, I mean, it was, it was amazing. I, I, I credit where I am today with everything we're doing largely to, you know, the example of my parents and their, and their way of approaching everything as I was growing up. So that, that put me on a track that I, I think I wouldn't be on otherwise. Oh, that's awesome. I love hearing when people, um, you know, have this great support system that has been able to, you know, keep them motivated and inspired. So, I mean, kind of getting into that, you know, when people do kind of have chronic illnesses or they're diagnosed with something new, mm -hmm. you know, typically people kind of go through this period of depression and have these lows and stuff like that. I know, um, you know, with my migraines, when I get stuck in a cycle, <laughs> where I'm having them for, you know, weeks and months at a time, I definitely have periods of depression. I've been, you know, doing this my entire life. But have you ever had any, you know, experiences like that? And um, if so, you know, how do you kind of get yourself out of that funk? Yeah, I mean, like I said, up until about 36, up until about 10 years ago, I, mm -hmm. I didn't really have to, I didn't really have to think about it. So I, it was great. Yes, in the last 10 years or so, with I've had six surgeries, four of them are brain surgeries, all of them are related to hydrocephalus. Right. Yeah, yeah. You you know, like the, the I had one in 2004, I had two back to back within 24 hours in 2014 because of an oh, infection wow. that developed in my cerebral spinal fluid. So it wouldn't reabsorb. So they had to go in there and, you know, and I, I ended up, long story short, I ended up being in the hospital for three weeks. Mm. Um, and and then they finally did the, the 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 surgery, and then they had to do it over because something went wrong with the first one, so they had to do it again. And then anyway, and the recovery time was long and hard, and it was just. But I mean, you know, honestly, one of the one one of the things that sticks with me is during that stay, I started to get a little cranky, a little irritated, yeah. 
I was a little irritated because once they once they relieved the pressure, I went in there and I felt terrible. I don't even remember the ride to the hospital. My wife drove me to the hospital. I don't even remember it. I was in so much pain. But once I got there and they relieved the pressure and did a couple things right away to help me feel more comfortable, I was I felt great. But I still had to stay in the hospital for three weeks. And I was right. so irritated about that. And it was because I didn't I didn't understand, but I I thought, okay, okay, we're in here for the for three weeks. I didn't know it was going to be three weeks at the time, but of course, you know, and my dad, you know, he saw me and came to the hospital several times, you know, during that visit. And, and he, he finally just said, look, dude, you got to snap out of this. You got to suck it up. These people are mm-hmm. here, the medical staff and doctors and nurses and everybody here under this roof are here to help you. He kind of, right. he kind of put me in my place, honestly, because it wasn't like I was really mad. I was just irritated. I was selfish. I was being, you know, and he was like, they're here to help you. So mm-hmm. suck it up, do what they tell you to do, you know, and, and, and don't make their life miserable, man, right. they're here to help you. And so by the end of that, by the end of that, uh, that was very transformative for me that when, once, once I heard that, and of course, I, I mean, I, I love my dad, I respect him greatly. And so I, I heard that and I was like, oh crap. Okay. If he says it, then I must be, it, I must be sure, you know, <laughs> I mean, he must be right. So I said, okay. So I. I, I thought about it for a little bit. I, and so by the end of that, so I started writing everybody's name down, you know, mm-hmm. that everybody, like, I don't care if they, somebody came in for two seconds to change the sheets in on the bed or the ch- check my vitals or change the IV or whatever. I wrote every single person's name after that. And at the end of the visit, at the end of my time there, I wrote everybody's name on that big board, that big white yeah. board that we use. And uh, and put big thank you on there and had everybody's name on there, and so I and nobody else saw it. Like I mean, hopefully people, hopefully some of the people that helped me during that time saw it because that was the idea. But I didn't tell my wife. I didn't tell my parents. I didn't. You know, I just kind of did it and left. And I was kind of like, okay, Dad, I get it. <laughs> you know. So sometimes you got to change your perspective a little bit, and that's what that's what that did. So it was, it was pretty, exactly. So for exactly. the rest of the surgeries, it was a little bit different. You know, I knew that there was, there was scary stuff the last ten years, but with that perspective, it it made it a little better. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, yeah. I mean, I know you know going when you're not feeling, it's not easy to not feel good, especially for a long period of time. So, I mean, I think it's kind of natural for us to get into a little bit of a funk and get irritated and stuff. But like you're saying, you can't stay in that for a long period of time because it's not just affecting you; it's affecting people around you and especially people who are trying to help you. So, so yeah, I mean, I think it's you know good to address that. You know, if you're also going through a medical condition out there at home, it's okay to have those low moments, um, but we just don't want to get yeah. stuck in that. <laughs> exactly. Well, and and to that point, and to the point of your, with the migraines, I mean, I had a very similar experience after that. So he, so that was after I left the hot, right, left the hospital, much better, you know, attitude about it. And then about two months after those surgeries, I developed migraines myself. Mm-hmm. and they started gaining frequency and getting worse and getting more painful and getting more frequent. And before I knew it, I was having a constant migraine headache, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for almost for a little over a year. Oh my and gosh. it was, it was awful. I, I thought my life was over. I've started filing for disability. I mean, I thought it was, I thought it was over, but that, that experience with my dad in the hospital, helped me during that year and every year since every day since Mm -hmm. that okay yeah we're going through this but first of all somebody else has it worse than you okay right right. somebody always has it worse than you so suck it up and second of all not to sound insensitive or anything but you know somebody always has something worse than you and you're here for a reason this god god knows that this is what he needs you to do and where you need to be Mm -hmm. so do something good with it, you know, wrote, you know, make something, make something out of it. So, right. you know, right. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I was actually talking to another gal who um, lived 10 years with a broken neck and Ooh. she was, yeah. And then she was telling me, she, she said this, uh, a brilliant thing that, um, that I hope I don't, I don't forget over time, but she said the same energy that you're using to be negative and complain 
use that same energy to be positive and practice gratitude. Because like you're saying, somebody, you know, not to sound insensitive or anything, but somebody always has it worse than you. And so really look, changing your perspective and saying, okay, yeah, this sucks right now that I'm having this horrible pain for this amount of time. But, you know, what, what do I have that I'm grateful for? You know, right. that you were able to wake up that morning, you know, open your yeah. eyes, that you have these, your loved ones around you, you know, um, that you're able to get up and walk around because like this lady, she was incapacitated for over two years. I mean, she literally couldn't get out of bed and I can't right. even imagine, you know, going right. through something like that. So to your point, um, you know, um, think about just kind of change your perspective and use that same energy to be grateful instead of complaining. So, yeah, I love, I love that. Exactly. So a question that came up when I was thinking about um, our discussion today was that, you know, um, your kids have seen you, you know, going through this their entire lives. So what kind of things like lessons or insights do you think they have gained from you having this condition that they've kind of grown up with that they necess that they wouldn't necessarily have if you had not had this condition? I think it has. I I I don't like that they've had to see me like that. Of course, I mean I. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, you, you think of your dad and you think of Superman, right? You think right. nothing, nothing can hurt this guy, right? He's invincible, you know. And so, and so, yeah, I could I can imagine that would be very shocking, to the, you know. And my oldest, who's who's twenty now, she she remembers a lot of it. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. my, my son who's 17 and my youngest daughter who's 14, they don't remember as much, maybe a little, but, but um, Elizabeth, my oldest, she, she was there, you know, she remembers me, you know, being carted off in the ambulance a couple of times and being gone for three weeks, and, you know, in another city in a hospital somewhere. And right. uh, you know, it, yeah. So, so I think that I, I of course, I can't read their minds, but I can imagine it probably taught them something along the lines of, you know, be grateful for every day you do have. Right. And, and it's, it's given them a huge amount of compassion. I think, I mean, they, my youngest is so, she, <laughs> she's so good, man. Over the last couple of years, I have ended up on the floor more than once because of oh, man. whatever headaches, vertigo, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. and uh, balance issues. And uh, you never know when that's going to happen. Like sometimes it's on the stairs. Sometimes it's in the living room. Sometimes it's thankfully when you're already sitting on the couch. Sometimes right. it's in the kitchen while you're getting dinner ready. And you sometimes you make it to the chair. Sometimes you don't. Um, and so more, more times than, than I can, you know, more times than once, she has seen me on the floor and just brought a pillow over. You know, just been like, hey, dad. You know, not because they don't care. Not be, It's not like, oh, dad's on the floor again, yada, yada. It's like, hey, dad, I, I get it. Here you go. Don't move. Don't get up. Don't make, you know, don't worry about us. We'll, we'll get the rest of this ready or whatever. Here's a pillow, you know, stay there till you can get up, you know, kind of thing. So they like they get it now. You know, they. Yeah. yeah. So when they see other people that are I, I think that when they see other people in those kind of situations, whatever the condition is, if, you know, if it's on the street or if it's in a you know, in a store or whatever, I, I think that's, I think that served them well. I think it kind of gives them a, you know, a vision for like, okay, I, I, this happens to people and we should be compassionate. Right. 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 Yeah, definitely. Definitely. That's yeah. Your kids have, have seen some stuff. So, so I'm sure that they have some different perspectives and insights on stuff like that. And then like you're saying, yeah, when they go out in the real world, you know, when they see stuff similarly like that, that happens, they kind of already yeah. automatically have a sense of what to do and how to react and things like that. So, so that's great. And I'm sure that they still see you as their superhero dad, <laughs> despite oh, what you think. I can, I can, I can still throw down with them with the best of them. No worries. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about your company, Hydro with Hope. I mean, um, I mean, obviously, I have an idea of how that kind of all started, but can you kind of tell us, you know, how did you get the idea of starting it? Kind of what's your vision and mission of it, and what kind of stuff do you do with your company? Thank you. So yeah, Hydro with Hope was uh, originally 
kind of the idea was birthed, so to speak, uh, while I was in one of those follow-up appointments from one of my previous surgeries in 2018, Mm -hmm. March of 18, I had a, a brain surgery and, and, uh, went well, everything was cool. We were just, uh, waiting, you know, a couple of months after the surgery, waiting in the doctor's office, waiting for the neurosurgeon to come in. My wife and I were there and waiting to, you know, here's the latest CT scan results, whatever. And, um, and we just, we were there and we were just sitting there quietly and we could hear kind of in the next room, uh, just the rumblings of a conversation. Couldn't hear the words, but we could yeah. hear the conversation. We could hear the tone of the conversation and it sounded distraught. It sounded like, and I, you know, I, my mind flashed back this first time. I'm probably one of the first times this is thought had ever occurred to me, but it was like, it flashed back to maybe what my parents may have thought when they got that news at two weeks old, holding their little two week old little boy. And okay, by the way, we're going to have to do brain surgery. So I kind of thought, Oh my gosh, I wonder if this family in the next room right. is getting that kind of news, you know? Mm-hmm. And so on the way home, <laughs> Uh, Catherine and I just, we're, we started brainstorming. We're like, what did we do? You know, obviously God has, has brought you through Jeff brought through, you know, so many things and you are so, you know, you're, you could do so much. What can we do? Right. Um, and so that's where hydro with hope started kind of there. And, and of course it took us a couple of years to figure out the logistics of it. And do we want to do brick and mortar? Do we want to do of course, we decided to do the website and do it online and do everything through Zoom and do everything through Facebook, you know, social media, because you can reach a lot more people that way. Right, exactly. This is really a worldwide thing. I mean, it's not just a U.S. thing where people live with hydrocephalus. So mm-hmm. that's where the kind of the, the beginnings of Hydro with Hope came from. And and so, yeah, in April of 2022, we started it. And uh, last year, we we turned it into a nonprofit organization. And um, we published a book, a journal that, that we wrote together to, to help people, which is behind me here. And I have a, a copy here as well that, that helps, you know, helps people navigate the, the craziness of this condition of, of, oh, my gosh, my kid's going to have to have what kind of surgery, you know, and, right, and all yeah. the things. And so, and then, so the book is one resource that I, I would love to get in the hands of every single person with hydrocephalus in the country. And eventually the world will work. We'll talk about different languages later, but, um, and then off, of course, I love to speak to organizations to, to educate them, give them hope, give the, you know, just, just because you're born with a condition that required brain surgery doesn't mean that your life is over. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I've, you know, and then, and then, you know, I, I love helping families through that experience. Um, mm-hmm. Holy smokes, you know, who should we reach out to? Reach out to me, reach out to Hydro with Hope, reach out to Jeff. I can help you. I can help, I, I can help navigate some of this with you. You know, I'm, I'm not perfect. I don't know everything about everything, but I do have 47 years of experience behind me with this. Right. Condition. So I want to, I want to give that to you and and put that to good use. So yeah, yeah, definitely. That's awesome. So yeah, people, please be sure to go to that uh, website that is streaming on your screen now. And now you can also use the QR code to go with to go to Jeff's um, Hydro with Hope. And uh, there I'm guessing that they can probably get the journal on on your website. Yes, you can you can you can order it right from the website. And, uh, that's the, that's the best place to do it. We're working on, we're working on an update. We're, uh, an updated edition. We're working on a, a second edition coming out. Uh, we might revamp the cover just a little bit and then we'll re-release it. And then it'll be a little more real readily available on Amazon right now, or, or, you know, kind of it's, it's a little less visible on Amazon, but you can always get it on the website. Hydrowithhope.com. Perfect. So yeah, you heard it here. People just go to the website, click that QR code, and you can get access to that journal. So let's talk about your TV show. So when did the idea of having a TV show start? And, you know, kind of walk us through um, what your hope is or was originally for the TV show and kind of what it's become. Because I I know having two shows myself that it kind of takes on, um, you know, its own being really. (laughs) 
right? Well, and so one last thing about Hydro with Hope. I just want to point this out. Yeah, when you scan that, wherever it is, that QR code, I, can't, I don't know where to point. <laughs> I'm trying to point in the right direction. Anyway, when you scan the QR code, the first page that pops up is the homepage, and you'll see a spot for donate to donate. Okay. And and that and we it is a nonprofit, and every dollar you donate will help somebody else. You know, help me be able to count. You know, uh, not counsel. I don't like that word, but it'll help me help another family uh, through that experience of oh my god, my kid's gonna have to have that kind of surgery, or it'll it'll put these journals in in more facilities and in more families hands more um you know just to just more widespread so i just wanted to point that out it we are a nonprofit and the first thing you see on that when you scan that qr code is donate here here's our story you know that kind of thing so but oh, awesome. yes that is where and part of that is what came to the tv show i mean honestly i i, I was at a, a business conference um, talking about hydro with hope. We had books, we had, you know, we had stuff there and, and, um, and the network president for, for achieve TV, which is the channel that we're on, on E360 was there, Julianne. And, and, and I, somebody introduced me to her and we started talking and she's like, you know, of course, when it's your own story, you don't think it's extraordinary. You don't think it's special right. because you've been living with it. It's daily right. life. You launch and adjust. You just, carry on and and, and adapt mm -hmm. but when it's somebody else from the on the outside and they hear a story like that they go holy cow and so apparently there was something there so we said okay what do we want to do and we came up with invisible condition because mm -hmm. we wanted it to be more about more than just my condition because i mean that's not going to last very long nobody wants to watch the same topic every single time so we said, right. okay, visible condition. So that's going to encompass so much. I mean, mm -hmm. from migraines, right, to MS, to PTSD, to schizophrenia, to, you know, whatever, I mean, you name it. You know, right. um, we've had so many different things on there. So um, people awesome. telling and their stories. Were... And, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. So what, what season are you in? Two, three? We are... We are about, I just recorded for this. I think we're about 12 or 13 shows into our third season. So we're about 120 shows in right now. Oh, uh, we've been on awesome. air for a little over the little over a year. So. Awesome. That's, that's yeah. amazing. So, I mean, what kind of, um, you know, because you, you just mentioned that you've had different people with different conditions on the show. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I know probably like me, you know, whenever I have a guest on, even though I might no, think I know something. I am really knowledgeable about something. You always learn something new and you always oh, hear man. things from different perspectives that you never really <laughs> thought of. So how have, have you had any of those kind of insights and aha moments? Oh yeah. Yeah. There's, there's been some, some definitely some aha moments. I mean, I, there's, there's been really common things on that, that, that everybody knows about, right? Like multiple mm -hmm. sclerosis or, mm -hmm. ADHD or traumatic brain injuries or fibromyalgia, you know, and things. And so you're like, oh, I know about that. Everybody's story is different. Yeah. And so, you know, somebody with fibromyalgia might also have this or somebody with hydrocephalus might also have this co-condition or this thing. And so it's just, yeah, I've had some, some moments of like, well, duh, yeah. Um, yeah, of course that would be the case, but also with some of the organizations that we've had on, oh my lord! Like I have, I have such a cool, amazing Rolodex, Excel spreadsheet Rolodex of of organizations now, that when I'm talking to people on the show, that I can say, hey, you know, I don't know if you know this is out there, but check this out, check this out, check this out. And it, it's been so helpful to be able to have that resource for other people. And mm -hmm. so that's been kind of a fun moment to realize mm -hmm. that, you know, we've talked to so many people, organizations from not just the U.S., I mean, all over the world, you know, that are doing amazing things. So that's been probably the coolest thing that I didn't expect to come out of this is to have this enormous pile of resources to, to help others with. 
that I never would have imagined. I mean, if you told me that that was going to be the case a year ago, I thought I, I'd probably tell you you were crazy, but it's been so cool to watch that grow. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I know that you've turned me on to some some organizations from when I was on your show. So thank you right. for that. And yeah, I think that's yeah. that's really cool that you've been able to, to really do that. Yeah. I mean, you'll further help people um, by getting them to hopefully other places that can really, you know, help them deal with their condition. So that's awesome. So your message that you're spreading with your TV show and your company is number one, that you're not alone. Number two, that there is hope. And then number three, that there is a community of help and resources out there for you. So can you kind of, you know, give me your thoughts on how you kind of came up with these kind of three, you know, um, pillars that you're, <laughs> you're trying to accomplish and, and how you're doing that with your company and your show? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, one of the things, I mean, obviously when it's an invisible condition, it's really easy to feel like you're the only one. You can, right. It's really easy to fall into that mentality of, well, am I, am I really feeling this or is it all in my head? Is it really mm -hmm. happening or am I a hypochondriac? You know? Um, <laughs> And of course, you know, the pain is real. And of course, you know that the ER visits are real and you know that you're on a medication and you know that you're going for treatments or whatever. But when it's invisible, you it can be tough, you know, and so you can second guess yourself, even if you're not, even if you shouldn't, it's right. very easy to second guess yourself. And so, and, and, and one thing, I mean, one thing that we, that I talk about at the beginning of every single show is very similar to that is that, you know, we want everybody with an invisible condition, you know, we want everybody to know that you do have a voice and you do have, because you got to be your own best advocate. Right. You have to be your own best advocate because when you're in the throes of whatever condition you're in that, you know, you have to be able to speak up for yourself. So you do, mm -hmm. you do have a voice and you do have a community because you aren't, and you are not alone. And that community is, is huge because that's where, you get some of that help and you, that's where you don't feel alone. And right. And you feel that gives you more, you feel more empowered then, you know, you're like, Oh, well, maybe I can speak up. You know, maybe mm -hmm. I can't, you know, when I go to the doctor and they think I'm crazy because I tell them that I'm feeling this, 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 and this, you know, no, no, no. I really do have a voice. So. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. No, I love that. I mean, I know, um, you know, with my migraines, I've had them since I was a kid, though. So I really didn't um, kind of struggle to find my voice when it came to my migraines. But definitely when I got diagnosed with my autoimmune arthritis and then also when um, my husband and I started to have some fertility issues, I definitely felt like, you know, number one, like you were saying, like I was alone. Um, because these just weren't things that I was familiar with hearing other people talk about. So I kind of felt like, oh my gosh, you know, this, I, I'm the only one in the world with this. What, what do I do? <laughs> Type thing, right. you know? And then really, um, I love how you say you really have to be your own advocate, um, you know, when you have a medical condition. Cause I mean, you know, in my experience, there there's medical teams out there that are trying to help you. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, we all are unique, and especially with the the conditions that we're going through. Even though other people out there might have migraines, my experience with them is completely different. So, really, like you're saying, um, voicing what's happening with you, what you feel like is happening with you, because it is your body, so you're going to know best. Oh, yeah. Um, and, you know, really um, advocate for your condition and the treatment that you need. And not necessarily, I don't want to say not, um, you know, take the treatment that's being offered to you or listen to your doctors, but also, you know, really um, research and figure out what is the best course of treatment for you. So, um, yeah. I know for me, that's been my experience. I mean, when I was in high school, I... You know, I don't, obviously you're in high school. I don't remember the surgeries I had when I was two weeks old or six right. months old, or, you know, that was, you know, before your conscious mind kicks in, you know, your body remembers, but your brain doesn't always, you know, consciously right. remember. So I, that, that surgery I had at 18 um, was the first one I really was aware of, you know, in this condition and all that stuff. And so, you know, but for two years leading up to that, 
so I had the surgery right after I graduated high school. But for my whole sophomore or my junior and senior year, I had I the, spare you the details, but the but there was it was something was going on for two straight years, and I was they had um, I was growing faster than the shunt could keep up, basically. Oh. And so they so there's the shunt, and then there's the cord that funnels that fluid into you know like the abdominal cavity or. Right now, it's it's going back behind my right lung into the pleural space around the lung, but at the time it was going into the abdominal cavity and and but that cord they put a longer one in there when I was about four so that I could grow it could grow with yeah. me I would ride and it wouldn't uh, hinder me at all. Well, it grew I grew in a way that it started to adhere to the muscular tissue and so it wasn't growing with me, and so as I grew up the shunt was pulling away from my head. Oh, wow. Which, which, as you can imagine, was very painful. Yeah. And so I had a lot of headaches that last couple of years of high school. I kept telling the doc, this is what's going on. I know what's going on. I live in this body. You don't. <laughs> right. Please listen to me. Please listen. This thing is coming out of my head. You got to believe me. And, you know, I, I don't fault the doctor, but, you know, he's like, okay, high school kid. Come on. I'm a doctor. Yeah. So, and I, you know, and so eventually they compared enough scans or whatever or something and they're like oh geez he's right and uh, so i did get the surgery right after senior year but i had to speak up i was speaking yeah. up for two years man i was standing up for myself saying this is what's going on and so yeah to your point of, of, of being your, your advocate i mean i learned that in high school you know i mean i it did not take me long to learn that that was very important and to speak right. up so that has served me well through these, you know, these last 10 years as well. That's, it's been super valuable. Right, right, exactly. And I mean, if you think, if you kind of think about it from the doctor's perspective, I mean, he's seeing you that one visit, right? And you're telling him <laughs> right. this stuff, but you've been going through this for two years. So you're like, I, I can walk you through why I think that this is happening. So just, you know, yeah. bear with me and just listen to me for a second. So, yeah. yeah. Well, and when you're a kid, when you're in high school, when you're in I, Sometimes when you're in high school, you you're not the greatest communicator. You That's know? true. I mean, I mean, our our kids are doing great, and I feel like they're doing really well in school and stuff. But I mean, I remember me in high school. I do not remember myself being super great at communicating. So, right. You know that is another factor too. So they're like, "What are you even talking about?" You know. <laughs> so, so I don't fault the doctors. You know, they they do know best you know, a lot of the time, it's just, you know, sometimes they don't, <laughs> you got to listen right, to the patient. Right. So. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and then, you know, I do come from being in healthcare for over 20 years and I know that, yeah. you know, some of my staff, I had to talk to them because, you know, they would see the same things over and over within a day. Um, but they, that, I mean, that they were used to that. And so we really had to talk about, you know, putting yourself in the patient's shoes where they're not getting, they're getting this diagnosis for the first time. You might be yeah. seeing it for the 20th time that day, but for them, that's their first time. So yeah, it's always, it's always good to keep in mind, you know, um, having empathy and compassion and really trying to see things from the perspective of the other person. Yes. 100%. Yes, definitely. Okay. So we just have a couple of minutes left. So thank you again for being here. So how can people um, get in contact with you? And then do you have any kind of final words of wisdom for the other people out there, the fellow people like us who are living with chronic medical conditions? <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I thank you for having me, by the way. This has been awesome. I, um, yes, best way to get a hold of me is that email right there on the bottom of the screen, Jeff at hydrowithhope.com. If you know anybody that might want to be a guest on our show or might want to join with us on the, on the show as a sponsor or anything, you know, invisible condition at E360 TV.com is a good way to reach me. Um, but really Jeff at hydrowithhope.com is the best way to reach out to me for, for most things. And um, yeah, I think, uh, I think the if if you don't mind, I can I can I, it's really really short. I just want to read one tiny little thing out of the book. Yeah, of course, it Go right kind ahead. of encapsulates how we how we approach the TV show and how we approach the nonprofit and how I kind of approach life. Um, so we you know we we were able to 
put this together and it says, having lived with hydrocephalus for over 45 years, I can say three things with 100% certainty. Number one, God is faithful all mm. the time. Number two, God is in control. It's a good thing. And number three, life does not have to be perfect for it to be amazing. So yes. that last one, I mean, it, well, and one other thing that's in here that I, you know, we have quotes from other amazing uh, hydro warriors and medical professionals in here. And one of the quotes that my wife, my wife said, well, you have to have one. So I said, well, what do I say a lot? So, so the one that landed at the, one of the two for my, for me landed in there says, uh, you, you know, you, you, you only have, you, your attitude is the only thing you have hundred percent control over. So, you know, just make it a good one. You know, I mean, just, <laughs> you, you really don't have control over much else. So. That's true. Um, That's true. Yeah. So, but thank you so much. This has been. Yeah. Super. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. you. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing your experience and all of your insights and telling us about your, your company and your TV show. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And then, yeah, people don't forget to reach out to Jeff and check out his um, company at the, at the QR code there on your screen. And also I recommend watching his show. I think it's great, especially since I've been on it myself. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, she was amazing, by the way, everybody. Go find her episode. She was awesome. It was great. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff, for being here Thank today. You. Right. Now, the month of April is actually Autistic Awareness Month. Now, because I and my team at Oversight Global, we want to assist in the movement to promote inclusion, acceptance, and support for people with autism. We are running a special campaign all this month of April where we would like to donate all the proceeds from the sales of any versions of my books. So Mindset, The Power of the Mind, Leader Mindset Activation, and then Leader Mindset Activation, The Accompanying Workbook. We're donating the proceeds from that to the autism organization, the Lake County Special Needs Birthday Club. Now, these books provide powerful tools and strategies to help you transform from merely managing the different aspects of your life to truly leading as well as cultivating a mindset for success and taking control of your destiny. So take advantage of this opportunity this month to not only enhance and accelerate your own personal growth and development, but simultaneously help to bring additional resources to the movement to expand autism awareness. So be sure to tell all of your family, your colleagues, and your friends, and go to that link that's on your screen now to purchase any or maybe all of our books. <laughs> All right, and there you have it, my amazing, phenomenal leaders, as this episode of Take the Lead, a Consciousness Movement with Anjali Kapoor comes to a close. I want to thank my guest, speaker, author, business owner, and fellow E360 TV show host, Jeff Pearson, again, for joining us on the show today and for sharing his inspiring story and message with us all. And also, thank you, beautiful soul, for being here with us today, too. Remember, Bright Light, you were meant to be here today to receive whatever message you are meant to receive from this episode. So keep showing up, keep loving on yourself, and keep making progress on your journey to becoming the phenomenal leader that I know you are truly meant to be. Now be sure to join me next week as I'll have another absolutely inspiring guest joining us. So Reverend Joanne Angel Barry Colin, who has over 40 plus years in the health, fitness, and wellness industry, as well as 15 plus years in the healing industry, will be here next week and we'll be exploring the power of intuition and leadership.
She's going to be bringing her tarot card deck with her, and we're going to chat about ways in which listening to your inner voice and trusting your instincts can help you tap into your full potential. It'll be another conversation that you won't want to miss, so be sure to set your reminders to be back here with me next Monday, April 22nd at 6 p.m. Pacific time. All right, my beautiful, phenomenal leaders, have a great week, and I will see you next Monday. Take care. Coming up next week on Take the Lead, a Consciousness Movement, guest Joanne Angel Berry Pollen is here for us to explore the power of intuition in leadership. Don't miss next week's episode on E360 TV.